coercion was. Of course it was coerced. There was terrible coercion on, on television. There was pictures of them playing table tennis and watching television and so on. But they were coerced into confessing. But David, held in a concentration camp for five years in circumstances we're now very well familiar with, is a self-confessed terrorist, according to the corporate media here. Now, this is one of the problems we have with a public debate in this country, is it? That the blinkers are firmly there and it's very hard to move past those issues. But I suggest we have to move past those issues and I'm not going to take up much more of your time, but we need to consider now that David, as of tomorrow, will be our responsibility, Australia's political prisoner rather than the political prisoner of the US, how we are going to deal with this issue of having our own citizens jailed uh, by a sentence not imposed by a court, how are we can going to consider the people that sign the papers to illegally imprison people in that sort of way, Why, who is going to take responsibility in our country for prosecuting the people. There are of course terrorists in our community. There are terrorists who have taken part in the slaughter of many thousands of people, many hundreds of thousands of people. I think we know who they are. Their names are not David Hicks, and I'll leave you with that. What is our responsibility now? David's back in our country. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Uh, next up we have Omar Mary, and as I mentioned earlier, Omar is the brother of Abdullah Mary, who's one of the Barwon 13 who are currently being held um, on some trumped-up terror charges in, in Melbourne. And I guess um, it's great to see um, Omar here this afternoon, but the importance of, of having people like Omar here today alongside Terry is to highlight, I guess, the importance of community campaigning in this um, so-called war on terror. I guess make no mistake that the only reason really that David is finally back home is because of the work that Terry's been doing, but also the work of the of community supporters of various organisations and individuals who've continued to keep up the struggle to make sure that the political pressure is put on to, um, to bring David home. And similarly, um, around these... Um, terror charges that are against the men both in, in uh, Victoria and in Sydney, um, I think it highlights just how important it is that in the face of hysterical, blinkered media beat-up, that there are um, people who continue to speak out against what the treatment of these men and against the so-called war on terror and how it's being waged at home. So please welcome Omar. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I want to thank, uh, firstly, Stop the World Culture. I think it's a fantastic initiative. Um, CRD, Civil Rights Defence Stand in Melbourne, we talk time and time again about the link up with the Sydney arrests and the Melbourne arrests. Just give you a bit of an insight of what's going on and how these, how these arrests come about and all the rest of it. I think it's very important. So I appreciate and I'm honoured to be here to tell you about what's going on, particularly with the Melbourne 13 down in, um, in Geelong. So thanks, uh, Paddy, and uh, everyone involved with Stop the World Coalition. Thanks uh, for inviting me, Danny. I really appreciate it. Um, to you, Terry, I told you before, uh, two months ago we had a um, fundraiser down at the Coburg Town Hall in Melbourne, and uh, I remember shaking Terry's hand but couldn't look him in the eye. Not a sign of weakness, but uh, two months ago we didn't know where David... We knew where he was. We didn't know what the future looked like. We were all... I just couldn't look him in the eye because, although I've been through a fair bit, he's been through a lot more than me, him and his family... But today we sit here and in only a matter of hours, David's back on our shores. Terry, well done, and inspiration to you and your family. Well done. Thank you. I got off the phone to my son, and I'm not lying, about half an hour ago, and he said to me, he's only seven years old, he's a bit depressed. He said, Dad, I only kicked one goal at Oz kick this morning. He averages three every week. But he, and honestly, in a, in a really, in a lovely voice, he said to me, but Dad, can you say hi to David? He's cool. I said, David's not with us. It's his father, Terry, but David will be back with us soon. So my um, son's here too, although not physically, he's in here in spirit anyway. Um, look, I just, like I said, I'll keep it fairly brief, but I really want to just give you a bit of an insight into the journey I've been through and um, how, I guess, cruel society can become towards Muslim people, particularly those families who have been involved because of the arrest that occurred in Melbourne. Um, there'll be questions later on if anyone's got any. Look, on November the 8th in 2005, at 2 a.m., I received a call from my brother to say that he'd been arrested 
and he kept it fairly brief. I know he was under a bit of pressure, possibly handcuffed at the time. I don't know how he made the call, but anyway. Um, he had a helicopter hovering above his home. He had... Um, I'm going to be very careful how I say things today because I'm on the brink of getting arrested, I think, for a few things I've said, but I'm pretty upfront and honest. There was uh, authorities there with guns, bulletproof vest, the, his street blocked off, 10 to 12 white cars. It was like a movie. He could not believe what was happening. I uh, only know that he was arrested on terrorism charges. It was still, still to this day, it's pretty surreal, but I um, went home and told my family and all that, and we all obviously had the day off. We made our way to the Melbourne Magistrates Court. And on radio, it was just frenzy. Um, imminent attack thwarted, violent jihad foiled. I could not believe it. And I named my brother, a few of my cousins, and a few family friends, and I knew this group of men. And I just still couldn't believe it. I thought, it just doesn't add up. We got to the uh, Melbourne Metro's Court. There was easy 80 cameras, international media. How the hell did they know about it before the arrests? Uh, it was just out of control. We find out also that at the very same time, arrests were carried out in Sydney. And um, as the court started, proceeded, the judge, Reg Marin, said, oh, they still don't understand, this is a judge, it's supposed to be neutral, why there were 13 arrests in Melbourne and nine in Sydney? Oh, tell me, tell me, the prosecution, what's, what, what relevance is this there? And they said, well, we don't really know. A few guys here rang a few guys in Sydney about two years ago. So the arrests were simultaneous, but they just didn't know why. They both coincidentally all happened. And... Um, Make no doubt, the rest of these men took place against the backdrop of, of the uh, new industrial relations legislation passed by the held government. Uh, I was speaking to a few officials from my union um, only a few days earlier. We said, they're coming. These new IR laws are coming. Are they going to pass them through the Senate just like that? And lo and behold, the day that they passed through, all of a sudden, bang, terrorism. Our country's under real attack. It's happening in Bali. It was a matter of time now, and it's going. I was still confused from a union perspective, from my, fa my brother being arrested and my cousins, and I was like, is this really happening? Have, have we really got the Australian public conned here? The old government's done a treat. I, um, I was tight-lipped for a couple of days until I spoke to my brother. I never had doubts about him. Uh, he, was, he was described as Australia's first suicide bomber, or planning to be Australia's first suicide bomber, and um, it wasn't a good feel. You got to, to be honest, you couldn't, I couldn't leave me home. For days on end, kids couldn't go to school. There was just media in the driveway, and you know the house was copped a few things on their windows, etc., etc. But I spoke to my brother. I generally didn't have doubts about him, but you don't just arrest people on terrorism charge and put them in the acacia unit, which is you know solitary confinement. It just so I really went through him, and um, and I used to drive him to work every day for for about two years. I know him well. I spent a lot of time with him. I don't know if that's good or bad, but I spent a lot of time with him and. And I know his body language and through the perspex glass and big bodyguards behind us and all the, the circus and the fanfare, he looked at me and said, what has Australia ever done to me? He honestly said that. He dropped his hands and he said it in a way to say, you know, I did say some silly things. Didn't know my car was bugged. Didn't know my house was bugged. Didn't know my phones were intercepted. Didn't know there was a camera in my neighbour's ceiling facing towards my house. So it was a real deal. He said some silly things. Um, I put it down a bravado, amongst other young Muslim men, silly things you'd say. Uh, look, I've said things about how with the IR laws, but I mean, his was a different scale, to be honest. But <laughs> reality is, uh, he made some comments, and gee, is he regretting it now? He sure is, but you know, thought crimes. Uh, was he going to go ahead with it? Anyone who knows Abdullah, mate, he's scared of cats and dogs. We walk in the streets and he jumps towards me. You know, like, reality, you've got to put things into perspective. Uh, People are going to say, of course, you're his brother. You're going to say that about him. He's an angel. He's brilliant. No, I've got a couple of funny brothers, but he's, he's pretty genuine, Abdullah. He's, he's, um, he meant no harm to his country. He's a suicide bomber. Not Abdullah Murhi. I'll put my life on the line for that. So he's certainly paying a, he's paying a price now for making some silly comments when he was 18. And that's sort of an age where we all sort of... Most of us probably go a bit off the rails and then we wake up. After the arrest... Um, Racism increased in the northern suburbs of Victoria, uh, namely Coburg, Brunswick, Broadmeadows, uh, particularly ladies wearing the veils of hijab um, and kids as well. Uh, without exaggerating, some were spat on. I remember some girls wearing a hijab got on the tram and the driver told them to F off, we don't want terrorists here. Uh, drive down the streets of Coburg, there was anti-Muslim graffiti, you know, Muslims F off, kill Muslims. I approached Moreland City Council and we were happy and we were fortunate enough to get that all sort of 
cleaned up, but um, 